Welcome to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. When you're ready to transform your sales for today's transforming market, we've got you covered with your host, the queen of cold calling and founder of Salesology, award-winning author, speaker, sales trainer, and coach, Wendy Weiss. Hi, welcome to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. And I'm your host, Wendy Weiss. I am the founder of Salesology and the Salesology Prospecting Method. I'm also known as the queen of cold calling. And uh, today we have a very special guest, one of my all-time favorite people, Tom Poland, who is the uh, founder of Leadsology. And um, he's also a multiple best-selling author. Uh, he specializes in the generation of high quality leads for professionals. His clients are in 151 cities around the world. And uh, Tom has started and sold numerous businesses over the last uh, 39 years. He's led uh, teams of uh, 100 plus people generating more than $20 million in revenue. And uh, Tom lives and, and works from his home on the Sunshine Coast of Australia, uh, complete with his much loved wife, his dog, always important to have a good dog or a cat, a tennis court, a swimming pool, and a private rainforest. So welcome. Welcome, Tom Poland. Thanks, Wendy, and thanks to my mom for writing such a nice bio. <laughs> so let's begin at the beginning, Tom. Tell us about your journey. Share your story. All right. So we'll start, start, starting from now, my specialty is, is setting professionals up with this weekly flow of new client inquiries, high-quality new client inquiries. So if we go from, from that point, working way back when, as a 23-year-old, I started a consultancy business. And this is not a smart thing to do. You know, you, you, you're still wet behind the ears and trying to market the idea that I could help mature businesses improve their sales and marketing uh, workflows. So it, it, was, it was tough because I was so young. And I, I quickly figured out, you know, I had multiple mortgages, I had multiple children, and uh, my wife was 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 supporting the family at home. So I was it, you know, I was the breadwinner. And I felt like I was waking up in a state of stress every morning, unemployed. And so I, you know, I, I had a problem. The problem was lead gen. I didn't have predictable, systematic, uh, relentless flow of new clients coming in. It was much more of a roller coaster. So. I bought every book I could on, you know, copywriting and running direct mail campaigns and advertising and literally flew around the world and sat at the feet of marketing masters and, and, and implemented religiously. I'd have to say I'm a pretty good implementer and nothing changed. I was still bereft of this predictable flow of quality new client inquiries. And it, it took me a few years to figure out the reason why the stuff that I was implementing that seemed to be working for other people wasn't working for me. The reason why, and the reason why was simple, is that when you're marketing services or advice, it's actually far more like you're proposing marriage than it is, say, selling a set of golf clubs or a washing machine, in that you need to establish a relationship of rapport, respect, relatability, and reciprocity with a prospect prior to proposing that you have a conversation about working together. So if you think about uh, selling a set of golf clubs or a car or a house, the physical thing that's on offer sells itself. You don't need to have a pre-existing relationship of rapport and trust with the seller. In fact, many of us have bought vehicles of people that you'd never have home for you know, a barbecue on Sunday with the family. We just don't like them that much. We don't click. But we like the product. But when you have consulting or coaching or training type services, People aren't going to buy that until they trust you, until they click with you. So and that was why my direct mail messages and my radio advertising and my billboards and everything else I tried just didn't get a response because it, those things work really well when you're selling a physical product that can speak for itself. People can take a car for a test drive. They can walk through a house. They can swing a golf club and go, yep, that's what I was after. So 
After a few years, I did find one marketing method that would produce high quality, predictable flow of new client inquiries, and that was running events. So I would hire a conference center. I'd fill a room with, you know, eight or 80 or sometimes on rare occasions, 800 warm bodies. And I'd strap my stuff on a stage for a couple of hours and hand out feedback forms. And essentially what the feedback form was, was asking him is, you know, tick a box if you'd like to meet because you like this stuff and you want to know more about working together. And that worked really well. So we'd, we'd send up 10,000 direct mail letters with tickets to an event and we'd fill the hall with that. And as I said, I'd, I'd run a workshop for a couple of hours and people would tick a box and we'd meet with individuals afterwards. And so that was the genesis of what we're doing today with, with webinars. The common denominator is that we run a webinar once a month, like we used to run a physical event once a month. And we fill that webinar with warm suspects, I guess. You, we don't know if they're prospects yet, but but we fill, fill, fill the, the webinar with, with an audience and show them how we work with our clients, demonstrate that. And at the end of the hour, we offer them to meet one-on-one. So that's where it started 40 mumble years ago, and that's where we're at now. Okay. So I know your most recent book is and it's a bestseller too it's a marketing with webinars and uh, full disclosure here everyone i have a copy it's a great book um and uh so why do you think webinars are so effective for lead generation because they don't have the immediacy of a live event um, it's very easy for someone on a webinar to be checking their email, checking their Facebook, doing something else. And I guess they can do that a little bit in a live event too, but they're more uh, captive, shall we say. Yeah. And there's, look, if, if you want one of the most effective methods for generating new leads, it's still the physical event. I mean, they're both live events. One webinar is a digital live event. Uh, a seminar or a workshop or an event, a physical one is is also live. So they're both live, but one's physical, one's digital. So the the challenge with filling a room with uh, physical bodies versus digital bodies is that it's typically more expensive and more complicated, and there's a lot more skin in the game required for participants, and and that's not necessarily a bad thing. You don't want them to have too little skin in the game, and you don't want to ask for too much skin in the game straight off the bat. Uh, and we so so, but the webinar, if you look at a combination of efficiency and effectiveness, so efficiency being how easy it is to get a great result, and effectiveness being what would give you the biggest result, even though it's not as efficient. So the combination of efficiency and effectiveness, the webinar wins hand down over physical event. Um, I still speak at physical events, uh, COVID permitting, and and I enjoy that. But um, it's only when it's someone else's event and they've invited me onto the stage. Uh, so, if someone is looking to develop a systematic flow, a predictable flow of new client inquiries, the webinar represents the low lying fruit. That's the other leads that you can get. Uh, you can get a system established with a monthly webinar, a fresh audience every month, the same presentation. And you can do that very low cost. Uh, you can get audiences for free. We can talk more about that. You can get high quality audiences and you can rinse and repeat that month and month out. So it's it's easier, it's simpler, it's faster. It's almost, almost uh, it's incredibly inexpensive. So it's like, why would you not want to start there? And then if you want to, once you've got an established flow of new clients, by all means, start running physical events. But they are more expensive. They are more complex and they do require more skin in the game. If you get an invitation to speak to a group of prospective clients at a physical event, you should grab it because it's incredibly effective and someone else has done all the work of setting the event up and getting the warm bodies in the room. But if you want to be in charge and control the whole marketing sequence from the initiation of the, the event and the, and the prospecting to the conclusion of bringing new clients on board, then webinars, uh, running your own webinar events is is the way to go. So I'm curious, did anything change for you with COVID? Did you find uh, people were more open to webinars? People wanted to do more webinars? So it, uh, everything stayed the same for you because you were already doing webinars? 
Right. Well, it's it's a great question, and it's one I get asked quite often now. And of course, I was I had already made the switch from physical events to webinars back in two thousand eight, so it was pre COVID. And you would like a lot of things in marketing. What we believe will happen and what we expect will happen is very often not what actually happens. And our ratios, and we we measure our marketing stats religiously, have a data scientist on the team who, who measures all the numbers, tracks all the numbers and has done for many years. Our, our stats did not change one bit. It was fascinating to me. I thought we would, uh, the ratios would go up. I thought we'd have uh, more attendees, uh, sorry, more registrations, more attendees. And I thought the thing would just flow through the whole marketing, what I call critical path, the series of steps you undertake with any marketing campaign. Uh, but the numbers didn't change a bit. They didn't change before COVID, during COVID, and wherever we're at now, if this is post-COVID or COVID hangover, what do we call it? They still haven't changed. The 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 numbers have all stayed consistent. Uh, what did what was different to my marketing versus the people that are running physical events? Uh, and I'm a big big you know a big big advocate of running physical events, so this is not I was smarter than them or anything. What did change is that it was completely seamless because literally nothing changed in our business. We still just kept doing the same thing. Um, webinars are the the marketing equivalent of vaccination against COVID because you just no one it doesn't matter if you sneeze on the screen no one's going to get COVID. Good point. Good point. So, um, and you said something that I, I want to talk about for a minute because it, you said you track the numbers. You have a, a data scientist on on the team, and you know I know for for our clients. Uh, getting people to understand the importance of knowing the numbers, uh, it's really it's really hard. And so yeah. I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit because um, with prospecting, people often treat it like it's an art form. And I come from an arts background. I was a ballet dancer. Prospecting is uh. not an art form. And um, so with what you do, I, I would imagine people also t treat webinars as an art form. And it's not yeah, really think, an art form. No. And, and the, the first bestseller I wrote, and I've certainly written plenty of worse sellers, but the first bestseller I wrote was called Leadsology, The Science of Being in Demand. And it is a science. Uh, and I, I, sometimes I wish it weren't because I'm not really a numbers person, but it is. And I, you know, one of the secrets of success is that you don't actually have to be very smart. You just have to be smart enough to know how dumb you are. So we've... We've built what is effectively a marketing machine, and it's been done on the back of tracking the numbers, the observation of reality, not the observation through a filter of our fears. Gee, it didn't work. That's a shame. Uh, not the observation that is filtered through desire. I really want this to be work, but the observation of reality. And in keeping a spreadsheet over a number of years, I could track what was working and what didn't work, and we needed to get to a point of statistical significance. I guess, you know, I got I got asked in an interview once uh, where I got my marketing degree from. And I said, the University of Observation. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, it's a top tip I could share with people is that you've got to observe reality and have one, one source of truth, if you like, one source of reality, which is the numbers. You've always got to go back to the numbers because the the, it, they, they don't lie. They can mislead if you don't have enough numbers, but they don't lie. And that's the final arbiter of the truth of what's working and what's not working and what needs to be changed are, are the ratios. So how many partners promoted our event? How many registrations did each partner generate? How many attendees came from each of those registrations? How many consults or new client inquiries were booked? How many sales were made? What was the average sale? What's the average lifetime? I've just given you all the steps in a marketing campaign and based on the average lifetime value of each new client, you, you can figure out a whole lot of things whether it's worthwhile or not. So, yeah, just just got to observe and, and track the numbers. And if you can't track the numbers, hire a data scientist from the Philippines for eight bucks an hour and get them to do it for you. You know, give them three hours a week. That's probably all they'll need. And then you've got a basis for evaluating what's working and what's not working. So if we have listeners uh, for this podcast today and they want to start doing webinars, how do they get an audience? If they've never done a webinar before, how do right. you get people so, to come to your webinar? Well, it, 
there's I listed about 115 uh, different sources of audiences or prospects. And, you know, there's, I guess if you look at this from a big picture point of view, when you want to generate new client inquiries, you, you essentially you need two things. You need a source of prospects and you need a, a, an offer. So the offer in this case, I think the best offer, the combination of, as I said before, the, the highest efficiency and effectiveness is the webinar. Lots of things you can offer. You can offer a one-page blueprint. You can offer uh, to meet for a sales conversation. Uh, you can just go flat out and offer them to buy something. But the webinar is kind of the sweet spot for the offer because it doesn't ask for too much skin in the game, but it does ask for some skin in the game, which is an hour of their time. And, and the skin in the game concept is one that folks could should underline because if you're asking for too little skin in the game by giving away a free, what I call triple S, a short, simple, shiny blueprint, mind map, whatever, it's not really enough skin in the game. Social media doesn't ask for enough skin in the game. The other end of the spectrum is buy my product or service now that's asking for too much skin in the game. And the webinar is kind of the sweet spot because it asks for enough, but not too much. So that's the offer. The second, sorry, that, that's the source of, of your prospects or audience. The second thing you need is the offer, uh, is, is sorry, the source of the audience or the prospects. So we've covered we've covered what the medium is or, or the offer, which is the webinar. Where do you get the audiences from? And again, there's a full spectrum you can of, of opportunities. You can go to Facebook and get them there. You can try online advertising. You can do 10,000 direct mail letters, which is what we used to do back in the day. And But where are they going to come from? They're going to come from LinkedIn. They're going to come from wherever. So now, the, the critical thing here, in regard to the, to the offer, we talked about skin in the game being the critical thing. Not too much, not too little. Webinars hits the sweet spot. The critical thing with the source of the prospects or the audiences is the reason. So that's the word you underline now is reason. Why did that prospect join that group? Why did they join LinkedIn? Why did they join Facebook? Why did they follow someone on Twitter? Why did they subscribe to an email list? Why did they opt into a direct mail? Whatever. So what's the reason why they are in that network? And the closer the reason for them joining that network, whether it's an email list or LinkedIn or Facebook, whatever it is, the closer the reason for them joining that group, closer that is to why they might buy from you, the better the quality of that prospect is in terms of their likelihood to buy from you. So reason is critically important when it comes to looking for a source of prospects or audiences. If someone has joined Facebook, they the reason they have joined is probably to keep up with their friends, their kids, their grandkids, their who knows, whatever. But they haven't joined Facebook with the idea that they want to improve their sales or their marketing or their executive leadership or, or weight loss or whatever it is that you offer. Um, LinkedIn, they've joined LinkedIn for one of two reasons, either a recruitment reason, they want to recruit someone, they're a headhunter, or they want to be recruited. They want to have their LinkedIn profile nicely polished in case someone comes along with a better offer. So there's the recruitment even a reason. And then there's a the sales reason. People are joining LinkedIn to either sell you something or sell something to your network. It's a business network platform. There is no one who wakes up in the morning and jumps out of bed and says, oh, goody, I'll log into LinkedIn in case there's something there I can buy. So that means that on the basis of my evaluation, which is the reason why people joined LinkedIn, is it's not aligned to the reason they might want to buy your service. But here's the, the sweet spot in the middle. If they've subscribed to an email list that Wendy Weiss at Salesology runs with an interest in increasing, in this case, their sales effectiveness, that reason they have opted into Wendy Weiss's email list is a very similar to reason why they might buy from Tom Poland at Leadsology. And if Wendy therefore sends an email to her email list and says, hey, this guy Tom Poland's running a webinar on lead generation, uh, he, here's the link, go, go have a look then that will work really well in terms of generating high quality prospects for my webinar. And I call this OPN. You probably heard about OPM, other people's money, OPT, other people's time and so on. But OPN is other people's networks. And this is most specifically in the form of email subscriber lists, where the reason that the subscriber has opted into that list is aligned to the reason why they might buy 
from you. And that is the sweet spot for fresh prospects and fresh audiences. It's other people's networks. I love this. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I will share with our audience that what Tom is talking about works really well. And so, uh, Tom, I want to ask you some more about uh, what people should be thinking about if they're going to put a webinar together. Uh, you know, what what is the goal of doing a webinar? Mistakes mm. people make. Um, before yeah. we do that, okay. we we are going to pause for a word from our sponsor. And our sponsor today is Salesology 3X Appointments. You know how frustrating and stressful it is when you leave every sales meeting wondering if your sales team knows how to sell because they're not selling and all you ever hear from them are excuses. They blame your marketing. They say you need to do more social media and they say you need a new website. You know something's wrong. You don't quite know what it is and you're even starting to wonder if it's you. You don't have a lot of options here. You could fire them all and start from scratch, and that would be pretty expensive. And you're really sick of waking up in the middle of the night wondering how to fix this. Well, imagine instead that you have an easy-to-use replicable system that ensures that your team can easily schedule qualified appointments. And imagine that your team is excited and motivated. No more excuses. And you feel good. Salesology 3X appointments can make that happen. If you're a business owner or a sales manager with an underperforming sales team, let's talk. Click on the link to my calendar in the show notes, schedule a time, and I look forward to meeting you. So we are back with Tom Poland of Leadsology uh, talking about generating highly qualified, excellent leads with webinars. Um, So here's my question for you, Tom. If you're someone that wants to start doing webinars um, and now you've explained where to get an audience, but what's the goal when you do that webinar? What should you be thinking about? It's, It's a great question. And a lot of people confuse training events with marketing events and they have different goals and therefore they have uh, different tactics. So a training event and a lot of, I know a lot of market webinars are dressed up as a free training. We do it a little differently, but uh, can come back to that. So a training event is all about imparting skills. It's about imparting knowledge and information and so on. The objective of a marketing event, however, is to have the right people reach out to you and talk. want to talk with you, book time to talk with you about becoming a client and just to validate that that's a good idea. And so if we agree that the that's the objective of, of any marketing event, be it uh, a, a, a physical seminar or a digital webinar, then we can work back from that and figure out what has to happen during that event in order for people to believe that it's a really good idea to reach out for you and, and, and explore working together. And the number one thing that has to happen is people during that webinar, they have to come to the conclusion that you are capable of solving their problem or helping them fulfill their potential. One of those two things. Um, people don't always come along with uh, in pain, having a, you know, a, a, a problem they want to disappear. Sometimes they come along wanting to fulfill potential. They're actually doing okay. They're not in a lot of pain, but they want to do better. So those two things, solve the problem or fulfill the potential. And so you can achieve that by giving a little about your bio, why listen to me right at the start of the webinar, what what are my qualifications for being here, my experience and credentials. You can further enhance that by having a section in your presentation is which called Where's the Proof? And this is where you can show screenshots of sales or before and after weight loss or unhappy and happy couples, the testimonials from clients. And if you don't have existing clients that can do that because you're starting out, then you can do a typical before and after scenario using what we call a Sam and Pam example. This is Sam before he worked with our services, all the gloom and doom and a few bullet points to say how bad his business or life is relative to the problem you can solve. And then on the other half of the slide, you introduce them to to Pam, who is students working with you and explain this would be a typical outcome for a client who's implemented 
So you build the credibility and you build the belief that you are quite rightly the person that can help them with their problem, solve their problem or fulfill the potential fairly early on in the webinar. And that could actually end up taking 20 to 25 minutes, but you do it in an engaging and fast paced and interesting way. But that sets the stage for then you demonstrating, and this is the part of the webinar we call the demonstration, of how you work with your clients. And the title slide and the invitation emails and everything makes it clear that this is not a free training webinar. This is, in fact, a demonstration of how you work with your clients to benefit, benefit, benefit. In our case, it's, you know, it's a demonstration. Come along and see how our clients in XYZ number of cities around the world are generating a weekly flow of new client inquiries in just one hour a month using webinars. So that's the title. So it, it's positioned as a demonstration. So first 20, 25 minutes is building credibility, is providing proof and evidence that the system works really well. And at that point, you then show them how you work with your clients. And you do that always in three parts, three stages, three parts to the method or the model. And it doesn't matter if it's 51 parts that you have when you work with clients, you distill that down to three parts because Three parts is three three steps. People will, will follow three steps. They won't follow four, five, six, seven, or ten steps. They, you'll confuse them. They get lost. And the enemy of motivation is complication. And you you briefly said before one of the biggest mistakes, the biggest mistake, other than having the right title. You don't have the right title. You don't attract the right people, and certainly not in the right volume. But after that, the biggest mistake when people present is making the darn thing too complicated. It, it's it's literally got to be so simple that a 12-year-old with no knowledge of what you do or how you do it could understand. And that's why the demonstration part of the presentation is always just the three parts. Because at the end of that part, we want people simply to go, ah, yes, I could see that would work really well. And the working really well is relative to the promise in the title. Promise in our title is how to get a weekly flow of high-quality new client inquiries using a webinar in just one hour a month. So our demonstration has to rationally explain how we do that. Well, that is so interesting the way you lay that out, Tom, because back uh, when I started my business and we're going back at 20, 25 years, um, I had a mentor that said, uh, when you do a talk, because I was going around to various networking groups and business groups here in New York City. And he, and he said, well, you know, you, you do a talk and you give them all this great information. And when you give them all this great information, you give them so much information that then they're going to want to work with you. And what I found doing that was uh, people would come up to me after my talk and tell me what a great talk it was and tell me how much they learned and then they'd leave. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I never got any clients doing that. So, you helped a lot of people. Uh, I did help a lot of people, yes. So well, there's, there's, there's two ways of looking at that, Wendy. One is there's, the old, there's an old marketing adage is you, is you tell people, uh, what what they need to do to get the result they want, but not how to do it. In, in order to get the how, they need to pay some money. Uh, and, and that's a, a valid way to do your marketing. The other approach is the one that, that I adopted, which is, I call it karma marketing, not, not karma as in quiet, but karma as in you reap what you sow. So the karma marketing philosophy says there are segments within any audience some one segment is people that just can't afford to work with you flat out, but they desperately need help. And I've been there, you know, I've been insolvent where I haven't had the money to pay anyone to, to get help. And so I want to help those people in the audience that, that literally do not have the money that are, that are struggling to make rent or put food on the table. I still want to help them. So I want to give them as much as I can to get them, get them started. I don't want to just be a tease and, and, dangle the carrot in front of them, but then whip it away. The The other segment of the audience are the people who have the money and are seriously intent on a solution. And it's like 10 minutes into the webinar, in the chat, they're going, where do I sign up? Where's the link? I want to buy. You know, they're what we call the seekers. And the third segment are, are, are the the explorers, the people who have serious intent to buy, but they're probably going to want you know four or five exposures to my brand before they make that decision. 
But what karma marketing says is I'm going to go all out to help all of those people, regardless of whether they're broke, whether they're ready to buy, I'm going to deliver a presentation, which is helpful. And the caveat is you've got to be explicit that they will absolutely struggle to do this on their own. And you've got to explain why they would struggle to do it on its own. And there's lots of different ways you can do that. But uh, I normally preface my webinars right at the start by saying, I'm going to show you everything. I'm not going to hold anything back. But please understand, as a full-time professional marketer, it took me 11 years to figure the system out. It's highly unlikely that you'll simply be able to sit through this demonstration and be able to put it in place at the end with any success. You, you will need to work with us or work with someone else to put this sort of system in place. It's just, just going to end in tears otherwise. But provided you understand that and you accept that, I am prepared to share with everything with you. So that's at the start. At the end, before the call to action slide, before we give them the link to reach out and book a consult, I have a slide that says why you should not do this yourself. And I go through the, the fact that there it's a whole system. There are many steps of the system. And we presented it in such a way that you could understand how it works. But in terms of implementation, you know, the map is not the territory. And there's lots of different analogies we can use. You know, it's like I, I can give you, it's, it's kind of like I've just given you uh, a manual and all the parts to build a car. Yeah, you probably could do that on your own if you're a genius. But, you know, chances are you need a hand to put the car together, right? So... My preferred position is to tell them everything, but to make it very, very explicit and to give them rational, logical reasons why, if they've got the money, they need to reach out and book a time so we can talk about working together. I love this, Tom. And I know that there are probably people listening to this podcast right now that are interested in learning more. And I know that you have a gift for our listeners. So will you share those details, please? Yeah. So if best thing people can do is go to www.gettomsfreebook.com and they'll be able to download. You can get it from Amazon as well, but but that link will give you a free copy, a PDF copy. And once they've downloaded that, they'll be opted into our email list. We'll, we'll send lots of cool free stuff, but they'll also be able to, uh, there's a link uh, once they've downloaded the book, they'll, they'll see there's a link to go and cop, download a copy of the slides that we use in our presentation. So it gives them the whole OPN system step by step. It gives them the persuasion sequence. In other words, how you put the slides together for the presentation. It gives them the call to action at the end of the webinar. It's We don't hold back. Just remember the caveat is that if you want to implement this and you do have the money on a credit card or in cash or whatever, then you really want to reach out and book a time to talk about working together because it's hard to implement on your own. But that's a terrific free resource, gettomsfreebook.com. And we're going to post that link in the show notes. So if you weren't able to quickly jot it down, no worries. Just go to the show notes as soon as you finish listening to this podcast and click on the link and you'll get Tom's free book. And I, I recommend that you you do that because it's really a great resource. And I also know, uh, Tom, if people want to just uh, watch your webinar, we're making that available in the show notes as well, correct? Correct. Yeah, that yeah. one's www.leadgendemo.com. But yeah, rock up to one of our monthly webinars and you can see how we strut our stuff and walk people through a persuasion sequence and make the call to action offer. Yeah. So both of those links are going to be in the show notes. So as soon as you're finished listening to this podcast, make sure to go to the show notes, get Tom's free book, and then go to his lead gen demo. So you'll see exactly how he does it, how he works his magic. And uh, so, Tom Poland, thank you so much for being here today. And um, would you put your hand over your heart and promise me that you'll come back another day so we can keep talking about webinars and marketing? Uh, it be a, a privilege and a pleasure. I can feel my beating heart between my palm right now. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you. 
So you have been listening to Salesology, Conversations with Sales Leaders. I am your host, Wendy Weiss, and we have been talking to one of my all-time favorite people, Tom Poland, who is the founder of Leadsology. And uh, thank you for being here and listening to this. And if you found value in today's podcast, then think about one business owner or one sales professional that you know um, that you think might also find value in this podcast and share the link with them. And until we meet again, visualize yourself surrounded by cash, really large bills. You've been listening to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. Be sure to follow so that you don't miss a single episode. And while you're at it, please leave a rating and review and be sure to share it with your friends. Tune in every week for more exciting insights and wisdom on transforming sales. And until next time, visualize yourself surrounded by cash, very large bills. Mm -hmm.